I'll kick off the recording. I will start now because the recording is in progress. Okay, welcome everybody to the uh, Lake Mary Technical Advisory Committee. Um, it is Wednesday, December 14th, and we're grateful you're all with us. My name is Spencer Brimley. I'm the chair of uh, said committee, and we're going to start with intros. Jory's going to go through the list and read off the organization. Just uh, unmute and say you're here. Um, and if we skip you, just put it in the chat. So, Jory, I'm going to turn this time over to you, sir. After that, Perfect. I'll do uh, approval of minutes. Awesome. Okay. Perfect. Um, and to make this easy, uh, alphabetic order by community. And then we'll get to our partners after. So Box Elder County, actually, pause, Bountiful. Yeah. All right, now Box Elder County. So Mark Bradley with Brigham City that's part of the Box Elder County. You're skipping ahead, Bragg's next. Oh, All right. <laughs> and then Brigham City. All right, Mark Bradley for Paul Larson. Thanks. Centerville. Clearfield. Clinton. Davis County. Bartley Matthews with Davis County. <laughs> is that a little is that an elephant, Bartley? It, it's my white elephant. I just got my white elephant gift. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> All right. Farmington. Um, here. Dave. Lyle's here too, I think. And Shannon. Oh. And Shannon. Baby. Um, far west. Brood Heights. Harrisville. Hooper. Kaysville. Layton. West Apollonia from Layton. Chad Wilkinson from Layton. Liz Felix with Layton. Joel and Grandy with Layton. And I see Mayor Petro also on. Um, Marriott Slaterville. <clears throat> Mida. North Ogden. Got Hess with North Ogden. Oh, Hess, you're breaking up up there. Time to get some new internet. Um, North Salt Lake City. We Allie, are here. Allie Avery, Shea Pace, and Mackenzie Johnson. Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, Ogden. Perry. Plain City. Pleasant View. Riverdale. Roy. No, oh, Steve. Okay. South Ogden. South Weaver. Sunset. Syracuse. Uinta. Washington Terrace. Weaver County. West Bountiful. West Haven, West Point, Willard, Woods Cross, Tim Stevens. Hi, Tim. Thank you. I was wondering if my mic was working after a minute. Um, UDOT, Christopher Chestnut, Region One. Thanks, Christopher. I see Brett's on too. Brett Slater, the German program manager. Thanks, Brett. UTA. Federal Highways. And WFRC. I'll do a quick intro for the group. We got Ted Knowlton, uh, myself, Jory Johnner, Hugh Van Wagenen, Lauren Victor, Michaela Jordan, Jordan Chandler, Nikki Navio. That looks like WFRC. Um, and if anybody that did not uh, make that list, want to do an introduction real quick. Spencer Hymas with Galloway. Spencer. 
See, Noah jumped on with Syracuse. Je Jeff Williams County. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, South Weaver jumped on, Trevor Cahoon. And Barton with Ogden. Thanks, hey, Barton. All right. Back to Trevin you. Blaisdell, UTA. Oh, thanks, Trevin. Yep. All right. Back to you, Spencer. All right. Thank you, Jory. All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, our next item on the agenda is the approval of our minutes from our September 21st meeting. Um, Jory, I um, am going to make one request uh, on the minutes, and this is not a big deal other than um, I am not the planning director for Clearfield. Um, I have a different title, but so if we could change that other than that, we're good, I think. Um, community development director is my title here at Clearfield City, so. Okay, we can make that change. I realize I have never said anything in the past, and so it feels like, man, I should have said some a while ago. So anyways, um, but any other issues with the minutes? Um, if not, I'll accept a motion for approval of the minutes from September 21st, 2022. This is Joy, I'll make that motion. Thank you, Mayor Petro. Do we have a second on the motion for approval of the minutes? I need to bring Jeopardy music to this meeting. I'll second. I'll second. We had, I think, Dave Peterson beat Brad by a hair. Um, so any uh, any opposed to approving those minutes, go ahead and say aye. Otherwise, we'll do a silent majority vote. So wonderful. I think those are past jury. We can consider them approved. Thank you. Thank you. All right, item number two um, has three bullet points underneath there, as you see it on the agenda. Our first presentation will be from the Ted Knowlton on context sensitivity conversations. Following Ted, we'll have a presentation from uh, Mr. Johnner on the 2023-2050 RTP update. And then item number C will be uh, Mr. Knowlton again on guiding our growth, as well as some assistance from Spencer, uh, whatever he makes up while Ted's presenting. So, Mr. Knowlton. Spencer, thanks a lot. Um, I want to apologize and explain why you you have a double dose of me today. It is because Julie Bjornstad was going to present this item and she cut her finger uh, like minutes before RGC TAC. So, sorry. Anyway, um, <clears throat> Context sensitivity, you may have heard this term before, and if you haven't heard this term, you may be working on it. The basic idea of that phrase, context sensitivity, uh, in the um, space of transportation planning is that the design and function of a road fits the land use and economic development context that it is within. Right, so uh, an example is, forgive me, uh, an example is University Avenue in Provo. As University Avenue moves down through the heart of Provo and you have Main Street style buildings, should the street design and function speed, sidewalk width, lanes, should it be the same as when it is in a kind of traditional suburban context or even um, uh, as it nears on the south end uh, I-15. Context should matter, right? Um, there's research that, remember, not my presentation, okay? <laughs> there is research that when we get the, the fit right, uh, Old reference, it's like uh, Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz, when the fit is right and people are dancing, then uh, you have safe, better safety. You have fewer accidents and fatalities and you have better economic performance. You have a more uh, uh, development intensity, willingness to develop uh, more intensely. And those two things are good for cities and for and for the state. Uh, so towards that end, a group of partners have gotten together to explore the question of what, if any, 
make sense to do in this issue at the early end of planning, right? So the long range plan process, the regional transportation plan or Utah's unified plan, that is not where project details get worked out, as you know. Instead, it is, it is kind of a, a, a framework of, of mode and uh, route, et cetera. Well, the partners um, have gotten together to explore how do we improve basically better the level of predictive predictability uh, in addressing context sensitivity together? Can we through through uh, MPOs like WFRC and Mountain Land, uh, can we have a conversation about where and perhaps the initial start of how we can work to have better context sensitivity? Now, you might be wondering, where, where are you going with this, Ted? What I hope that you will take away from this presentation is that you understand what we're trying to do, A, and then the big thing is B, if you want to be involved, we would love to have some local planners kick the tires on a framework that we have. So we have a draft framework. This is like a 40% draft. We're 40% through working out how to do this. And uh, we really wanna make sure at the end of the day that it, this is useful and meaningful for everybody that implements these things. That's basically cities, UDOT and UTA. And it's really decidedly not WFRC and MAC, but we are a really great convening entity. So that's where I'm going is I wanna give you enough information so you kind of know, oh, okay, this is what is being worked on. And then B, you, you have enough information that you can think, well, all right, I'd like to be involved in that. Uh, I'll just tell you right now, the involvement that we're looking for would be something like two meetings, two hours each, something like that. Just kind of a sounding board. All right, I already talked about the predictability of the regional transportation plan. We're nicknaming this initiative Wasatch Choice Great Streets, a framework for balancing regional transportation needs with community context and vision. Framework is a key word. We know we're not working out the details. We're not trying to work out the details. We're just trying to improve predictability for uh, those that implement uh, both context and street uh, issues together. Um, okay, why Wasatch Choice? The rationale for Wasatch Choice Center is that it's an agreed, agreed upon uh, definition of the locations where context does shift from, uh, you know, standard um, suburban or, in, or industrial um, types of uh, environments, right? So a Wasatch Choice Center is more intense than its surroundings tends to be mixed use and walkable, and it is agreed upon. It has been blessed by the, the community that is affected by a center, and it has been adopted by a regional council. And so because it's an agreed upon framework for where context shifts, that's the rationale for having that be the geographic focus of this framework. Um, what we're looking at doing is establishing clear principles of what constitutes a good fit, uh, checklists, perhaps considerations to work through trade-offs. This is really like we're just kind of in the in the early sausage making of on this. It's drafty. Uh, performance measures. How can we measure the extent to which there is good fit? Uh, part of the concept here is to map out the typology of a street. Is a street based on its context and also based on the work it needs to do to move uh, uh, cars, freight, uh, traffic, transit, whatever, uh, its regional role, um, those two things together, can we identify it as, you know, is it a main street? Is it more, uh, a, you know, a major, uh, freight moving corridor, let's say, is it something in between? Is it something that supports that? So we're kind of thinking of a pretty coarse four 
uh, category typology. And then we would map out that typology uh, again as a starting point, not to determine the specific solutions, but to help provide some clarity and predictability for those that uh, that work out the details. That's the idea. Um, uh, because we have a 40% draft, we think, hey, this is a great time. If there are community reps that, you know, you want to wade into this, you kind of have to put on your regional hat. You kind of have to set aside this very specific thing that you might be working on and think, what would make sense on a regional planning basis as I think about what would be helpful for me as a as a community planner? That's really the kind of the role that we're looking at. And I will um, just stop because I think there are others here that uh, have been involved in this so far and can um, say, uh, can help me out with something that I've missed or perhaps I have misspoken, uh, but certainly not on purpose. So I don't know if anybody uh, in the room wants to jump in on this or if anybody has any questions on this. Um, and, uh, and then I'll just say right before turning to those, um, if you are interested, please just, you can put a note to me in the chat here, or you can email me or Julie Bjornstad, uh, ted at wfrc.org, and whatever Julie's email is, Julie, you know what it is. Okay. Of course I know what it is. Julie B at WFRC. I'll put them in here in a second. All right, great. Um, are there representatives from the steering committee, UDOT? Um, UTA that would like to also uh, augment anything I've said. Okay, back to you, uh, Spencer. Thanks, Ted. Appreciate you stepping in at the last minute and hopefully Julie's okay. And uh, it's not too dire that she didn't lose a digit or something. So, um, but anyways, uh -oh. thanks for your presentation. We will now, oh, sorry, is there something else? Okay, I'll turn this time over to Jory for 2023-2050 RTP update. All righty, thank you. Can you all hear me? Good, all right, perfect. Um, appreciate this. Um, I'm gonna do a quick update on the 2023 RTP. I think most everybody on this uh, call um, I see have been involved in some part, but it's always good just to do a, a quick overview. Uh, Wasatch Choice Vision, um, which is our key uh, product at WFRC, um, has, a, has three, three components uh, that help uh, develop it. Economic development, land use, and transportation. Um, before talking about the RTP today, you can see on the right there, uh, the 10 regional goals. And these were adopted by the regional council. So our elected officials, your bosses, um, uh, approve these goals. The entire RTP process looks through these. So, you know, everything from livable and healthy communities to safe user-friendly streets, clean air, open spaces, rec opportunity. Um, with that, um, the RTP more specifically is multimodal. So active transportation, walking, biking, uh, roadways, transit and the tie to the land use. So your land use plans um, and the vision. Um, updated every four years. The last plan was adopted in 2019, uh, May, which means we are three and a half years into this planning cycle. Um, it's financially constrained, meaning it's not just a wish list of projects, but uh, we work really hard with our MPOs and uh, UDOT and UTA to identify uh, existing funding sources, growth rates, um, and uh, reasonable new uh, funding sources that uh, are related to transportation. And it needs to conform to our air quality conformity budgets that are given to us by the state um, for the mobile pollutants. Uh, you can see here, it's not just projects between now and 2050, but a phased project uh, list. And, and the phases this plan are 2023 to 2032. 33 to 42 for phase two, and then phase three is 2043 to 2050. Um, you can see at the bottom, 
where this really um, you'll probably be most interested in is nearly every funding source that's related to transportation relies on the projects that are in phase one to the RTP. Um, the WFRC programs that we fund, uh, federal funds that we fund through our transportation improvement program, the states uh, of capacity projects uh, and their funding sources look at this uh, at the RTP, uh, federal programs do if you're gonna apply for any federal grants. So uh, very important that we get the right projects uh, in this phase. Um, as I made mention, we've been working on the plan. And just as a reminder, a couple of years ago, uh, you all helped us review uh, external forces and policies, and those included connected and autonomous vehicles, uh, drones, micro mobility, local street connectivity, um, transit signal priority, things like that. Um, we moved um, into our preferred scenario, projects needed by 2050 uh, a year ago, and um, you all helped us do that along with uh, input from uh, workshops, UDOT, UTA, stakeholders. Um, and then this year, we've been identifying, uh, working on the phasing of the plan. So uh, we brought the needs-based phasing to you all this last spring, and then this summer, the uh, financially constrained plan. Um, and then uh, hopefully most everybody on here attended uh, the workshops uh, that we just had and, and took quite a few comments there. And we're moving to um, our public comment period and final adoption. So. Uh, the final stretch is around the corner. This is a reminder of those workshops that we had. Um, we had hosted eight of them uh, with about uh, 250 to 300 attendees from local communities, um, not including our partners uh, at UDOT and at UTA. Um, these invitees included uh, elected officials, so the mayors, county commissioners, city council, uh, your planning commissions, and then key staff. So I appreciate uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, helping us uh, with getting such a great attendance on that. I know uh, you all, uh, quite a few of you, um, worked with your planning commission, city council, and elected officials to get them to the meeting, and so hopefully that was, was useful. At the same time, we um, met with some key stakeholders. So we've met with um, a community advisory committee that uh, recently has been kicked off that uh, focuses in on a minority, low income, senior uh, type of group. Uh, we reached out to the resource agencies uh, this last go around. And then we've met with key landholders. So Daybreak, Point of the Mountain, the LDS Church Landholding Groups, that's PRI, FRI, SLR, Rio Tinto. Um, we've met with the uh, bicycle groups or trails groups. So Trails Foundation of Northern Utah, the Parley Trails and Trails and uh, Tunnels and Bike Utah, and then key universities and colleges. So, so Salt Lake Community College, University of Utah and Weber State. Um, and then also a few other groups that are in, very interested in, in transportation. So we've done quite a bit of uh, outreach and through that outreach um, and kind of over almost a two month uh, period, we took comments at those meetings, um, you all, grabbed a Sharpie, I'm pretty sure I stuck a, a marker in a lot of your hands. Um, and then we also had our interactive map available to uh, provide comments. We, we received almost 350 comments and you can see the breakout there, about a hundred on the roadways, 68 on transit and about 185 on active transportation. Our goal was to get comments on the phasing and um, if, if we had those projects in the right phase, I do believe there were some additional, you know, project changes and, and Hugh, Nikki and Lauren have been diligently looking through those comments, following up with UDOT and UTA or one-on-one, -on -one, you know, correspondences with each of the uh, local communities that made the comments. So appreciate your all uh, quick feedback and, and, and response to their outreach on that. Um, I think we're, uh, we're really close or we've got it nailed down um, now. So just as a reminder, um, we have about a billion dollars in the plan or funding available for active transportation, just shy of 18 billion for roadways and uh, 6 billion for transit. And this is how it breaks down compared to the needs. So the dark uh, bars there are the, the numbers I had just given you. The needs obviously um, should not be a surprise to anybody. Uh, 
exceed the revenues available, existing and projected revenues. Um, and you can see that um, in this chart for all three modes and by phase. So it's it's not like, well, we we're short on funds, you know, in this 10 years, but we're good on the other ones. We're we're shy and we have more needs in each phase than we do uh, have funding projected. Um, and you can see a total of about $35 billion of transportation projects um, needed, capacity related uh, projects in the regional transportation plan. This does not include um, maintaining or operating those facilities or the existing um, uh, infrastructure we currently have. When we get to the, uh, the unified plan financial projections and numbers, we'll uh, account for all of those. We'll account for you know, maintaining and operating our existing infrastructure and the new uh, expansion, um, either you know, on any of those three modes. Um, and in the last plan, that statewide was um, nearing $110 billion. So um, pretty good chunk of, of the, the needs here along the Wasatch Front. Um, rightfully so. With that, um, we are preparing for a public comment period. So we are slated to go out um, for an official public comment period between January 17th to February 16th. Uh, in that comment period, we'll have an interactive map, a draft regional transportation plan uh, document, and the draft air quality conformity memorandum uh, number 41 uh, for uh, review and input by, low, uh, by the general public. Hopefully, um, you know, we've taken comments from all of our partners and local communities, so I'm not expecting a lot of comments coming from you all, but, uh, you know, if something comes up, feel free to reach out to us, let us know if we've missed something. Hopefully, we've done our due diligence in getting your comments uh, addressed, um, and this this part I'm hoping with the with the outreach effort we did this last fall is a minimal uh, minimal amount of comments that we need to address. Um, looking towards um, April RGC TAC meetings and RGC and regional council a review of the final plan or draft final um, adoption on May 25th uh, by the council. Uh, we're going to continue efforts coordination on the the unified plan and outreach and look to um, actually have a little bit of an accelerated timeline on our unified plan um, work in anticipation that we'd like to um, be able to communicate the statewide needs for transportation um, and the, the, the performance measures for that um, by the time the fall uh, conference season comes out, right? So normally our unified plan is tied uh, to getting done before the legislative session. Um, in this case, I think we're going to try to accelerate it by a few months. So look for the unified plan uh, information next fall, but uh, more near term and, and more local, the uh, RTP draft plan and, and public comment period will be coming out here in about a month. So that's all I have as an update to where we're at in our planning process, open to any comments or uh, questions from anybody. And if uh, we don't have any, then back to you, Spencer. Thanks, Roy. I don't see any questions in the chat. So I think... Um... Very good, Ted. Yes. Air Quality Conformity Memorandum number 40 was a uh, nail biter, but uh, 41, primo. There we go. That was a little behind, it looks like. Okay. All right. All right. You thank you. Bunch right. of comedians. <laughs> it's, it's a fun group over there at WFRC. We are just jealous. We don't have as much fun as you guys do all the time. Oh, you should see all the behind the uh, scenes heckling we give each other, right? Behind the scenes, ah, uh, we all hope to be behind the scenes. But alas, we are not, and so we will proceed <laughs> forward with the next presentation. Uh, so Ted. Oh, I it's about yeah. guiding our growth and a ULUI or Utah Land Use Institute conversation. So back to you, sir. I would not have laughed so heartily if I realized I had already unmuted myself. Sorry for that. <laughs> That's what we enjoy about you, Ted, that hearty laugh. We enjoy the hearty laugh. I'm almost, okay. I assume you all can see that. 
Um, let me know if my audio fades. I think it may have in the earlier presentation. So what I hope you'll get from this short presentation is a sense of how this uh, statewide uh, growth conversation is unfolding, what it is and what it isn't. Uh, and so that you won't be surprised. You won't be surprised as it unfolds. And then also uh, there is an opportunity, again, if you want to be involved, we'd love to have you be involved. Um, there's no pressure on any of these involvement opportunities, but if it sounds interesting to you, uh, I think that the um, planners uh, in communities sort of really have their heart on, their finger on growth issues, what their um, elected officials are, are feeling and thinking about and, and uh, uh, can really be helpful in this kind of taking a step back uh, statewide level of growth conversation. So um, there's two major pieces to this. The first is kind of an overview of the present of the effort. And the second is a key component of the effort, which is scenarios uh, or st stories for how growth might unfold. Um, the name now for the statewide growth conversation is guiding our growth, guiding our growth. And this is being led by the Governor's Office of Planning and Budget. Uh, Laura Hansen is the project lead uh, on sort of the day-to-day -day management, but it was really convened by the governor. Um, why am I presenting this? I'm presenting uh, because WFRC is one of two entities that are chairing the technical work for this effort. Um, so that's, that's a WFRC's role. Uh, there is this uh, basic point that we lead out with in the Guiding Our Growth effort, which is that as Utahns, really anywhere around the world, for a, in large measure, we don't have a lot of control. I mean, in America, we don't have a lot of control over how much or how little we grow. Uh, but we do have a lot of control over how growth unfolds. So let's focus more on the pragmatic question of how growth unfolds and less on something that we really don't have a lot of control over, which is how much or how little growth occurs. Um, it's not so much if Utah will continue to grow, but how. And a basic point uh, there is that it's the very things that we love about Utah that makes Utah grow. And, and it's really difficult then to slow growth unless you make Utah a place that is not attractive. We, I'm not gonna go through these numbers, even growing fast, everybody knows that. Um, so then the goals for this overall effort are, hey, let's have Utahns weigh in on how growth should unfold uh, in a general matter, not towards developing a geographically specific vision or plan. Right, so we already have visions and plans, general plans. We have regional transportation and Wasatch choice. Let's understand, help more people understand what those plans are uh, as they weigh in on this general question of how growth should unfold. Third bullet point: After we go through that process, let's well, let's come up with a shared list of big moves, ways that we can work to improve that we can work to implement that will achieve what Utahns want as they have weighed in on this uh, process. And then um, uh, together uh, advance those big moves. That's the fourth bullet point there. Lots of partners. Uh, you can see that this is covering the entire state, the area, the association, oh, associations of government around the state, including WFRC, uh, are partners to this, but you also have the Chamber and the League of Cities and Towns and Envision Utah uh, and more, uh, the Tennessee Garden of Policy Institute, et cetera. Uh, this is not exhaustive. There's a website, guidingourgrowth.utah.gov. There is a live survey and uh, we would love to have you share that survey in your community. If you can get it in your city newsletter, you can certainly share it with your elected and appointed officials. 
that is most helpful. And a member our, of our staff will put the link here into the chat so that you have it. Okay, so that's that's part one, the overview, right? The overview of this effort. I'll I, Later on, I'll just give you, right before I wrap up, I'll give you, here's the schedule. Now, the scenarios are kind of a big way that this conversation will be had. Uh, we know a scenario can be, it's just a story of how the future unfolds. Like an individual can have a, a scenario. What happens if I go to a graduate school or not, or I marry the redhead or, uh, or not, right? Well, how will my future unfold? Well, when we're talking about options for the future uh, for growth, it's the question of where, um, perhaps how dense, what kind of transportation system, what type of open space, these kinds of options for how growth might unfold. So we'll explore these. The idea with these scenarios, I really want you to take home is that we are aiming this to be for a general public. So this is pretty rudimentary, uh, but there's a lot of sort of um, connecting the dots that planners do that it almost becomes second nature that aren't intuitive to residents. And so remember that when you see these scenarios and you see them come out in the coming months, but in late spring, they will be pretty basic, but uh, we need to have this conversation on a kind of a basic level so that, that uh, people that are new to thinking about how growth unfolds, they'll make connections of cause and effect, okay? So these will be pretty high level, such as, hey, what happens if we grow a lot in existing communities or we really keep growth out of existing communities? Really simple kinds of things like that. Uh, and then, well, what would that mean for affordability and water use and many other things? So people are thinking about how does the future unfold? What does it mean for the quality of life? And then later on in the process, we get to how do we accomplish the, uh, the, uh, the things that you want, the growth options that you prefer. And really, again, we want, uh, we don't want people to make connections for how pieces fit together. Let me give you a very basic example. Lower, uh, the lower density um, development patterns are, the more land they take up. We know this, but it's sort of, a, it's sort of a, an intuitive thing. So lower density, um, it tends to occupy more uh, you know, rural or open land, unless that low intensity is occurring through infill and redevelopment, which is also in and of itself difficult. As growth clusters near uh, transit opportunities, we have the ability to fund and make viable more public transportation. So, you know, we know these things, but it's not always um, what I think that the general public sometimes will say, look, we want great transit and also no housing uh, uh, on that corridor or anywhere near me. Thank you very much. Can you go work that out? And why doesn't anybody have a plan? So, like, let's, let's, uh, that's the kind of space we're in. So, this is super high level. This is the actual graph, um, kind of top level organization of, of the scenarios. There, there will be more detail of these, but we're thinking of two major variables. Is it more greenfield or infill? Is it more dispersed or is it more centered? And so one example of a dispersed but infill setting might be you have a lot of uh, accessory dwelling units and you have the occasional fourplex that is allowed in an area that is otherwise single family home. And you just get sort of, you get community level infill, but it's not necessarily focused. That's the lower right quadrant. The upper left quadrant would be like you have complete communities in, let's say, in the daybreak kind of fashion, and they occur in more places at the edges of the metro area. So you follow me? I think that the other two, the suburban estates and the downtowns and centers are very intuitive. But these are the four kinds of quadrants we were, we were thinking currently will really help people kind of grapple with major trade-offs uh, that affect how growth unfolds. And so there's a storyline. There's a lot of graphics. 
And then there are, here are the metrics uh, to move forward on. The graphics, we're thinking of telling the graphical story, mainly at key scale, valley or region, like these graphics. And then for different types of communities, you know, a suburban, a lower intensity suburban community or a part of the region urban community, different communities have, have a different sensibility of what is normal. So we'll communicate that scenario. Here's what it means for a community like yours, right? And so uh, that's the idea of big growth options, graphics, will weigh outcomes. Uh, this is a set of findings that we've been hearing around the state of what residents say, look, we want to meet our water needs, have household affordability, these kinds of things. None of these will be a surprise to you. And so our metrics uh, will relate to uh, what we have been hearing from stakeholders uh, over the last handful of months. And then the basic timeline, this is my, um, I'm preparing to dismount from the balance beam here. Uh, the major timeline is we're going to release these scenarios in late spring. Uh, and then and then that's sort of this next big phase of the um, of the statewide growth conversation. And it wraps up pretty fast. It's kind of a quick, a quick effort. So love to get um, feedback uh, or or any questions on this. And then this is the next technical committee meeting. If you are interested in being engaged here, we'd love to have you be part of this technical committee. This meets on an every other month basis. I think you'd be looking at approximately a five meeting commitment, about 90 minutes roughly each meeting would be uh, what you would need to pencil in um, if you were interested. And just let me know, Ted at WFRC, if you are. Uh, so we'd love to have any questions if you sort of, if I didn't quite um, lay out uh, how this might be unfolding or uh, or if you won't have, a, have any other uh, questions about, um, you know, uh, of any type. So, Spencer. Thanks, Dad. Appreciate that, uh, that presentation, the information. Uh, looks like Stephanie's interested in the committee um, from Weber County. So, um, you've got one more to help out. And uh, if you haven't gone on and taken the survey, so I took the survey earlier this month, uh, just encourage you and recommend everybody get on there and be a part of the process and get involved. And again, as Ted suggested at the beginning, share it in your community and make sure people know that this is a conversation. I know um, we've had a few projects lately where people have questions about water and density and growth and all these things. And I think it's it's well suited for us to be a part of that conversation uh, to help our communities understand impacts and opportunities associated with growth. So, Ted, thank you so much for uh, your presentation. And I would say, as a dismount, 9.5. I think you did well. So, well done. You are the Nadia Komenich of presentations. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, okay, uh, item number three, we are going to hear from Mr. Hugh Van Wagenen on the Park City map and upcoming Davis County um, map. So, I'm not even going to pretend that I know what those are, Hugh. Hugh, I'm just going to turn it over to you. There it is. All right. Thank, thanks, Spencer. And just one quick clarification. This is Davis, California. We'll talk about that towards the end of the presentation, um, although Davis County is also a fantastic place. So many of thanks. you uh, maybe have participated in our mobile active transportation tours in the past where ourselves and Bike Utah and the locality come together to host whoever wants to come, elected official staff, to come and check out the biking and walking infrastructure in any in given place, talk about some of the successes, the challenges. So this last fall, we are able to group together and go up to Park City, September 27th. It was a lovely fall day. And um, so I just wanna give you a little recap of that and then talk to you about um, our big out-of-state tour um, that we're planning for next year. So we did a nice loop through Park City and, you know, as you can see all of the ski runs here on this map, you know, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the great mountain biking that they have and sort of outdoor recreation that they have. <clears throat> but they, they probably have an underrated urban trail system as well, paved trail system that actually gets people from place to place within the community, and, um, not just residents, but obviously tourists as well. So we went up and, and checked out the urban paved trail system. Uh, Alex Troy was one of our hosts. Many of you probably remember Alex he used to work for WFRC. He's now with Park City and taking us through. They were able to lend us 
their bike share bikes. Um, Park City is really proud to be the first municipality in the country to have an all electric bike share system. So the first all electric e-bike system uh, in the country is pretty cool. And um, they're unique bikes um, and pretty fun to, to run around on, especially with some of the inclines that they have in Park City. One of the first stops we did was looking at particular bike parking. So these cool big yellow uh, pieces of art that you can walk your bike to them. And Park City has a program where any business can request bike parking, bike parking in front of their building. And it's uh, funded through transportation demand management money that Park City has. So you can request that, city comes out, talks to you about where to locate the parking, et cetera. And you can get that installed for your business and our property. So a cool program that the city runs there. Uh, one of the big things that we always talk about when it comes to bike networks is wayfinding. And you can see the, the signs up here in the upper right hand corner of the picture uh, talking about directionality, some have distance. You can see some signs that also have, not these ones particularly, but right that have an approximate amount of time it'll take you to bike or walk to a destination that's along there. So it's nice to see uh, those elements come together. Uh, up in Park City. Also another uh, great thing that they have along a lot of their trail system is public art. <clears throat> and so again, it's not strictly functional way to get there, but it makes it enjoyable to be in that space and to uh, help you enjoy your time as you move through, move through the community with the public art. And again, biking, walking really give you the opportunity to slow down compared to some other modes of transportation where you, you can't see as many things uh, necessarily as you move through a community. So uh, this trail here is part of the big uh, rail trail that runs through the city and heads <clears throat> um, way outside of the county. And one of the things that the city's been trying to do is increase the access to these major regional spines that they have in the city. So just off uh, to the left of the picture here, you can kind of see a ramp that goes down. So the city, the, the rail trail has been in place for a long, long, long time. And more in recent years, the city is saying, how do we make this trail more accessible to different points in the city? So they have what I'm calling these on and off ramps and directly into community developments <clears throat> to help people access uh, these trails, these, these spines, especially from commercial destinations, which is really cool to see in, in increasing the availability of trails to more people. In this picture here, you can see there's paint on the ground, right? it's tactical urbanism, there's temporary treatments that have been uh, applied and tried and tested to see what works and what doesn't. Uh, this is a particular space around a crosswalk where they eliminated some of the parking, tried to highlight the crosswalk through some bright colors um, and make it safer for pedestrians crossing the street. You know, with these tactical urbanism efforts, it's really low cost, it's minimal time commitment. You can adjust on the fly and, and adapt to feedback that you're getting. And it's a great way to test something out before, you know, full capital improvements where it costs a lot of money and there's a lot of design involved. Uh, so Park City's uh, using this in a lot of different uh, capacities. If you've been to Park City, you know there's a couple of main thoroughfares in and out uh, of the city, and they can be really difficult to cross just due to the sheer amount of vehicular traffic that goes through there. You can see in this picture of that big uh, truck uh, that's up there, that dump loader. Uh, plus all the other traffic. So Park City is really trying to get underneath these major roadways with tunnels uh, that connect their trails up. You don't have to deal with at-grade crossings of these larger uh, vehicular facilities. This one's located right next to a school, uh, fairly new um, and great way for students to be able to get from their neighborhoods over to this school that's right next to this busy road. Something pretty unique with this specific tunnel is you can see the black paneling on the edges. It's actually solar panels that helps power the underground melt system, right? To keep this tunnel clear of snow and ice when the bad weather does hit. And so it's a maintenance thing um, to be sure that it can be used year round and not just during you know, the more temperate times of the year. This is another picture, a separate tunnel. Uh, so you can see they do get used um, quite a bit uh, for folks, uh, pick up, drop off uh, parents, et cetera. Uh, one of the things we did talk about was their bike share stations. The bike share system is not operating year round. <laughs> um, the bikes go away during the winter months, the stations get pulled up and they actually use the space that the stations were using, usually along roadways for snow storage. Uh, so they try and use a unique combination of land for dual purposes 
um, you know, depending on the season. And so that was, that was really great. Uh, with these mobile active transportation tours, um, if your community is interested in hosting a tour and working with us and Bike Utah to do that, we'd love to get with you and feel free to um, reach out to me. I can be reached at hugh at wfrc.org um, at any time. So we're looking for opportunities in 2023. One of the things we've done in the past are what we call the out-of-state maps, out-of-state mobile active transportation tours. Uh, however, the pandemic has put that on hold. We haven't done one since 2019, I think. And uh, we're excited to say that we've been coordinating with Davis, California uh, to go out there this spring and experience their city. For those not familiar with Davis, they are a platinum level bicycle friendly community as designated by the League of American Bicyclists, one of the first communities to implement any type of bike infrastructure in the nation. As, and as this article sort of highlights, um, they've been taking bicycling seriously as a transportation choice for 55 years. So they have a lot of experience there. And it's about a community of about 70,000 people, um, you know, which isn't huge, uh, but not too small either. So we're looking forward to this. If you are interested in attending, uh, this is more of a save the date or a few months out from this, or know people that are interested in attending, uh, please get a hold of me again, Hugh at wfrc.org. Uh, this is uh, a pay your own way, but Bike Utah and WFRC take care of their logistics, uh, make sure everything's running smoothly, provide you with all the information you need. However, um, transportation and accommodations uh, would be at your own expense. So thank you, Spencer. That's, that's all I have and look forward to hearing from more of you if you're interested in any of these mats. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Hugh. Appreciate it. And uh, sorry for the confusion there on Davis. Uh, Davis, California is a beautiful area of the country. Um, and uh, that'll be an exciting time. So, Coolio. All right. Uh, our next item on the agenda is a presentation on disruptive technology and policy um, or a drone delivery update by Jared Esselman. Jared there. I am here. I am here. My uh, my daughter and I are about to pull up to Sky Park Airport and actually go look at some disruptive technology. Um, she is uh, she she did a little fundraiser to get, pay herself into space camp, and NASA invited us to come look at an electric jet engine. So we're gonna take a look. Very cool. Very cool. And let's be honest, they didn't invite me. They invited her. <laughs> <laughs> um. So yeah, we've got a couple of really cool disruptive technologies happening here in Utah. And there is a slideshow and I appreciate the WFRC team uh, driving that slideshow for me. Um, we just got done uh, it from, from last session, last legislative session, Senate Bill 122 and 166 were passed. I believe it was 166. Um, if you can go to the next slide. So there we go, yep, Senate Bill 122 and 166. Uh, essentially what they did is they said, hey, we know advanced air mobility drone package delivery is coming. We know aerial taxis are coming. We need you to go do a study for us um, and find out how we can embrace it. And so we did. And that study, uh, as we were doing that, we actually looked at, the, looked at the state and what we would need to implement and what policies we would need to start. And so we did. And we actually have two drone package delivery companies in Utah right now, you can skip the next slide. Um, Zipline uh, has started delivering packages and they are in South Jordan and they're delivering medicine, uh, whether it's prescription or over the counter with Intermountain Healthcare. Um, but that you can also order anything from a bag of M&Ms to you know, your last minute can of cranberry sauce that you forgot for Christmas dinner. Um, and they'll, they'll do a little bit of everything. So right now they're just delivering in South Jordan. Uh, they, their limitation is an FAA regulation on beyond visual line of sight. So they have to do everything within line of sight. They do have a pretty impressive facility built. Um, if you get a chance to go look at it, you should. Once they get, because they're fixed wing drone, once they get, uh, and that's that drone on the top, once they get beyond visual line of sight approved, they'll actually be able to make, um, deliveries as far up and north as Ogden. Uh, that's within their range. Now they will, they will um, build other facilities to extend their range even further across the state, but just that one facility in South Jordan can reach as far as Ogden. The other operator in the state is DroneUp and they came with Walmart uh, 
literally weeks after we made the announcement with Zipline, drone up at Walmart, we're knocking on our door saying, hey, we, we want to play in the sandbox. Uh, and they are currently talking to Harriman, Utah, Sandy, Utah, and Centerville, Utah. And I understand from this morning's briefing that the conversations in Harriman are going really well. Uh, I do know that the conversations in Sandy are going really well. Also, um, I haven't heard from Centerville in, in, a, in a while, in a spell, but uh, I hope that they're doing well also. Um, and so that is currently happening. This is not, you know, this is not a disruptive technology that we're, you know, planning for some type of Jetsons future. This is happening today. So um, let's go ahead and skip the next slide. So a couple other use cases, uh, air cargo, obviously the drone package delivery, but we're also looking at a couple, one company in particular that wants to come to Utah and uh, manufacture their eVTOL, electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicles. Um, uh, they're looking at Augment, so we're very uh, excited and, and chasing that one very eagerly and aggressively. Uh, we also have several other companies that are looking just to come and not manufacture, but operate in Utah as aerial taxis. Uh, we also have a company looking to provide emergency, very unique emergency services. And what they do is they have a small, very fast, very light uh, vehicle that would take a first responder to the scene of an accident or the scene of an injury very, very quickly, drop him off so that he can be with the patient, stabilize the patient. The ambulance would then take the first responder and the patient to the hospital and the truck would have to come pick up the aircraft. It's not meant for a round trip. It's meant to get a first responder somewhere fast. And that's all it's meant for. And so um, we're looking at inviting them to come and work in Utah. Uh, we have made that invitation and, and we're, we're working on uh, that. The FAA has called that a watershed moment. As we talk with the Office of Integration, uh, Office of UAS Integration at the FAA, they they really look at that as Utah's watershed moment in advanced air mobility. And you can go ahead to the next slide. Um, we've done several studies on advanced air mobility and, and for all of the, anyone in the planning community, you're more than welcome to check these out. You just Google Utah Division of Aeronautics. You scroll down to advanced air mobility and click on that tab and you'll find all of our research studies through UTRAC. Uh, our, our AAM corridor simulations. We've got a couple of videos up on simulations. You can check those out. And then our um, legislative report will be at the top of that list. It just released two weeks ago uh, and it's a comprehensive report for the full state. Go ahead to the next slide. Uh, you can actually skip this slide too. So what the report talks about and what you're gonna see in legislation um, Ali, I can't put the chat, I can't put the link in the chat physically right now, uh, but if someone wants to, it's just, you can Google Utah Division of Aeronautics and AAM and put that link in the chat. Um, you will see legislation by Senator Harper come out in January. Uh, the language is already available. Um, we will be defining advanced air mobility. Uh, we'll be addressing some abrogation easements, but that will probably be part of the 2024 bill. We will be addressing state licensing and permitting of bird ports. We will definitely be talking about um, unmanned aircraft registration. Uh, the bill will give the Division of Aeronautics the go ahead to start making those rules. It'll take us about 12 months uh, and we'll have that ready. We should have that ready by the 1st of January of 24. Um, and then we'll have to create an advanced air mobility restricted account, but that should be in the 2024 legislation as well. Go ahead to the next slide. There we go. So as far as cities are concerned, um, there will be zoning language, which uh, cities will be encouraged and if not more than encouraged, the, the language that is used will be a shall, um, adopt the zoning language to include takeoff and landing operations. Um, there'll be you know, as these businesses come in and look for business licensing and municipal permitting, the, the legislation will address that as well. Um, and it will, it will discuss vertiport verti overlay zones. There's another piece of legislation I think Melissa Ballard is bringing forth that will talk very pointedly about airport overlay zones. And you can expect that that language will be also be adopted for vertiports. 
Uh, and then finally, um, putting uh, advanced air mobility, there's part of the legislation that talks about putting that in municipal land use planning and a lot of the planning that the WFRC does. So go to the next slide. When should cities start considering enacting it? Uh, well, the information is out now. That was actually a question in the meeting this morning as well. I would say the information is out there for you. You don't have to wait for the legislation to pass if you wanna start working on it now. The legislative report that's on our website and, and I saw Joy put out the links for, um, you can go ahead and download that, start reading through it and it'll tell you what you need. Um, and you can start working on that right now. So, and let's just go ahead to the, oh, okay. So let's talk about how soon this is because that was a good question, good segue, I appreciate it. So the industry timeline is, is aggressive and quick. Um, they're looking for, I mean, like I said, we've already got drone package delivery in the state. This is, this is a reality, it's happening and it's gonna grow fast. As soon as we get beyond visual line of sight approval from the FAA, as soon as we put in a few pieces of infrastructure that allow that to happen, you're gonna see it explode. Um, you're also gonna see as soon as electric aircraft get their certifications in 2024, we're already planning on electrifying airports. You're going to start to see that happen. That, that has less to do with the municipalities and planning, but indirectly that feeds into aerial taxis, which are going to be right on the heels of those electric aircraft. And as soon as the FAA certifies those, you're going to see those uh, go into manufacturing and, and you'll start seeing them operate. Um, now, is it going to be tomorrow? No. Uh, industry would probably tell you by 2025, which for planners is tomorrow. <laughs> but our timeline is a little more conservative. You can jump to the next next slide. Although I will say NASA, NASA predicted that advanced air mobility, aerial taxis would be viable and economically feasible. And that's important part, economically feasible by 2030. Um, so this is our phased approach, and it's in the report. You can read all about it. This is our phased approach. Um, phase one, in the next two to three years, we'll build infrastructure to meet the current drone package delivery demand, as well as uh, electric aircraft demand. Um, beyond that, we're looking at digitizing the airspace from Ogden to Provo, uh, the, the major portion of the population. And then phase three, expanding that out beyond, you know, all the way to Brigham City, up into Logan, down into Payson, stretching down into Nephi. Um, and that'll, that's probably seven to 15 years out. And then 15 years, we're looking at statewide connections, right? Taking that same model, replicating it between St. George, Cedar City, Moab, all the way out to Vernal. Um, and I'll show you some, some graphs of those. You can switch and go to the next slide. So here's just a quick graph of phase one. Like you said, there's the zip line. Uh, that bottom picture there is the zip line range. And you can see how, how broad that is. The top picture there is the drone up ranges um, for, from their Walmart centers. Now, initially it's one mile, but they wanna go out to uh, 10 miles and even further. You can go to the next slide. For every dollar that uh, the state or local municip municipality puts into infrastructure or planning for advanced air mobility, um, we absolutely can expect private industry to, I won't say match that, but you know, they're gonna come in and you know, once you say, hey, we're open for business, we have the infrastructure, they're gonna come in and build their businesses. They're gonna come in and start doing those drone package deliveries, start looking at land for vertiports and start operating. And so we're also very, very conservative on our industry investment forecasts, um, but this one, this current one, this phase one is really solid. It's really solid. Um, we know what we need to put in and we know what private industry has already put in. And that's what those numbers reflect. You can go to the next slide. Um, and we'll just skip this slide as, as well. Okay, so here's a quick little uh, graphic of what we're really thinking about. And you can see the, the the point, the new point development that the state's doing connected to Silicon Slopes and connected up to Daybreak. And you can see how those are connecting the Wasatch Front. You can go ahead and skip uh, and where we're thinking about putting vertiports and where they, we think they would go. Again, state investment, um, 
private industry forecast. Let me skip that one. Let's skip. That's the that's the digitization of the Wasatch Front. So that's really if you, when I say the digitization of the airspace, think of the the all of the airspace above each of these counties completely monitored, managed, actively managed um, by the Division of Aeronautics. You can go to the next slide. Okay, these are our primary aerial corridor considerations uh, for, for kind of our first stages. Go ahead to the next slide. And we're gonna keep going. Right here, this is what I wanna focus on. This is the end game. This is where we wanna be um, in, in 15, 15 years. Jared, you're muted. Sorry. Uh, a full connected system across the state, primary corridors um, connecting the major mo metropolitan Wasatch Front to, to um, uh, Vernal, Moab, and the St. George Cedar City area, secondary corridors connecting those. I mean, this is all, this is a, this is a full comprehensive, you know, if you live in Moab or live in Richfield, you're jumping on an electric aircraft, flying into South Valley Regional rather than Salt Lake, jumping off that aircraft onto an aerial taxi, taking you downtown, taking you down to Silicon Slopes, taking you down to the, the Utes game or Cougars, whatever your flavor is, you know, whatever. Um, but, but moving people, goods, and services through the air to alleviate the need for more pavement, more pavement, more pavement. Every, every time we, we build a lane mile, on I-15, we get diminishing returns and it's just more expensive. So, uh, you know, as a, as a disruptive technology, electric aircraft and vertical takeoff and landing aircraft um, really allow us to connect the state at a much lower cost. And to be honest, in a much greater way, I mean, there are no straight lines on the roads between those points. So this is, this is truly changing the way people move and changing the way people live. And that I'll end there, Jory. Hey, I have a question. Sure. This is Dave Peterson from Farm to Say. This is all pretty exciting. How much further in the future, a decade or longer, will it take to have a drone big enough to go right up to the uh, and pinpoint right over uh, the start of a forest fire and dump retardant or, or water on it? Not long. Not long. Good. That's that's. Um, there are firefighting drones in operation today in oh, wow. uh, in in different countries, um, and you and you can go on YouTube and watch them. Um, they they will spray water into you know the seventh the seventh uh, story of a of a building or the you know fifth floor of a building. Um, so they exist today. Now, if it's going to be when you say a drone big enough. When you say a drone big enough to drop water on a forest fire, technically, technically, we could uh, take any current, um, you know, seat single engine air tanker, make it autonomous, make it a drone, and that, that's a, a drone dumping water on a forest fire. Uh, but a quadcopter that large, a vertical takeoff and landing vehicle that large. Um, it might be a while simply just because that's not the primary market for those. Um, no. But there are there are aircraft that could be converted to drones today. And, no. and there are small drones doing it in buildings today. Fascinating. Thanks. Yes, sir. Oh, There's a question in the chat um, asking when should cities start considering enacting these zoning regulations and what is the horizon in this? And I was just going to jump in um, in here uh, that USU with uh, Jared's team at, at UDOT and the Division of Aeronautics, there's an ongoing feasibility study right now of UAV fair to port and land use um, and location planning. And uh, the first workshop just happened a couple of weeks ago. Um, but if you're interested, uh, reach out. And um, there's a couple more workshops that will look at 
uh, you know, what does that look like for site selection? Um, you know, what are some of the zoning and land use considerations that we have to be um, developing as part of this guidebook that USU is leading on? So, um, yeah, reach out if you have, if you're interested, and we'd be happy to share more information about that. Awesome. Thanks, Nikki. And thank you, Jared, for that presentation. That was, I agree with Dave, quite intriguing, interesting. And uh, I've heard talks of this, but uh, it's getting real, we'll say. So super cool. Yeah, it's Thanks, very Brad. real. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Jared. I, I'd even add, Spencer, that we, um, this was one of our 22 external forces and policies that we you know, the disrupted forces we looked at um, with some of you a few years ago. And at that time, you know, uh, and, and this is a, a testament to how quick things are moving. Like we had really no great indication that, you know, this would be knocking on our doorstep right now. Um, we kind of pushed it off and said, oh, let's, let's address that next plan or sometime down the future, there's not enough information. Um, and we focused our attention on a few other of those items. Um, since then, Jared reached out. We've had multiple meetings with uh, him and his uh, division over there at the, the Department of Aeronautics. And we'll continue that collaboration. And I can only imagine this uh, getting more, more eyes on it and more coordination in the, up, in a, in the next plan after, after this 2023 plan and, you know, ties to... Um, the other modes. So good work, Jared, and appreciate your all your hard work. Maybe maybe an annual update could be even appropriate if it's moving that quick. <laughs> yeah, could be uh, it, yeah, it is moving that quick, and I appreciate it. Thank you, Jory. Okay, awesome, awesome, awesome. Great information. All right, the final item on our agenda today is uh, a roundtable discussion for 2023. Um, so this is meant to engage with you as communities that are part of our RGC TAC and see about how you'd like to engage, be a part, participate in future meetings. Um, so more or less, I'd like to have a discussion over the next 10 or 15 minutes um, about um, what you'd like to see added to the agenda for community participation. So whether that's presenting on uh, different topics or things going on in your community, um, but a way to better highlight and, um, you know, identify things that are happening within the communities that are part of this group, um, because it's always beneficial to hear from our friends and neighbors and other communities. Um, and I'll defer to WFRC's team if they have any thoughts from, um, or thoughts that would help spur this conversation along or that they heard from any other meetings that they've had relative to this participation. So opening it up to everybody to say, how would you like to engage and, and be a part of these uh, in the coming year? So our five meetings that we have coming next year. Hope somebody's writing this all down. I can, um, well, one idea, love to just, see if any, uh, if there's uh, interest in this, but one idea is we could um, brainstorm, organized brainstorming, like using, there's survey interfaces that we can use for this, but organized brainstorming around uh, topics of mutual interest. Who knows what they might be, but it could be parking regulations. It could be form-based code. It could be redevelopment and infill. It, I, I don't know, okay? It, uh, it could be water issues, um, annexations. I have no idea, but maybe, maybe we identify a prioritized list um, for the communities that are represented by this pack, and then for high priority items, items that have a lot of interest across a lot of communities, then we just pick, pick that we do one or two, maybe just one at a meeting and have 
uh, one community that uh, is, has some thoughts or perhaps has some best practices uh, or just simply wants to present, um, see the conversation. And then we swap notes and it could be as short as 10 minutes or it could be a little bit longer. And so um, that's what I'm just that I'm just saying that's that is an example of uh, of something that we could do. And maybe that example will then help seed other ideas or permutations that you've got. Thanks, Ted. No, appreciate that. So I guess based on some of the, the, the example that Ted provided, are there topics, ideas, concepts, things that this group would like to have in coming meetings that would facilitate either a presentation from a community and a discussion? Or looks like Dave's unmuted. He always has something to say. <laughs> I think that, at least my personally, I really don't know that much about strategies related to the homeless population and what's working. I, you know, you read the paper. I read a couple of weeks ago where Aaron Mendehall, a representative from the county and a couple of representatives from the state, went to a city in Florida that apparently is doing it right or, or trying some really uh, cutting edge things. And, uh, you know, you, we used to think that this was I think a lot of people think, oh, this is a Salt Lake City problem or whatever, but it's not. It's all up and down the Wasatch Front. And I, I never thought homeless people would make it to Farmington, but they have. And uh, we we do have a, an encampment here. And uh, and so uh, I, this may, I, I don't know about other planners, but this is something I, I don't know much about. And it would be nice to know what's the, the latest out there. I think that's a great thought, Dave. And I think sometimes we like to insulate ourselves thinking this is somebody else's problem. We don't want to think about it, but the reality is it's not one community over another. It's a, a widespread issue we're dealing with. So yeah, I think there's value to identifying those things that that we, we should be discussing because we're all experiencing in some degree. Do we want to make a list, Jory, or put it in the chat? How do we want to document these, uh, I guess, thoughts as they come up or what's the best way to do that hey, we i don't think we necessarily i mean maybe we come up with one idea for our next meeting okay but we could we could if there's interest in having like a rotation of different of different um issues and that, that and 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 you like you all like that idea then we could start the next meeting with that organized brainstorming you have some time to think about it so we don't necessarily anyway whatever however you this, want to proceed Spencer You're I think more so to, to start the conversation Ted was the expectation here to get people start thinking about what that could look like and then possibly at our next meeting that that be where the ideas come forward I mean is that what you're saying I just want to make sure I'm, I'm understanding as well I I mean I defer to you that's what I meant yeah, no, that, I appreciate that. I mean, I guess I'll defer to the group, but uh, more so, what would you prefer? Do we put out some ideas here that we could bring forward in, or uh, an idea that we could bring forward in our next meeting in February, um, and then at each meeting identify, or do we put forward several ideas and then put those on a on an agenda for our next five meetings and and get some uh, support relative to that? Feel free to put it in the chat if you'd like to not speak. I have one more thought. Sorry for taking up time here, but the uh, it's fun to tell some fun. It's sometimes educational discussing our own personal our, our war stories and swapping ideas uh, when uh, when we put the presentation together uh, with uh, Sherry for the, the last APA conference. I was we were fascinated with some of the things North Salt Lake's doing, for example. And uh, uh, and likewise for the league meetings on what's constitutes better development with uh, uh, Frank Lilly. And you know, right now we might be plagiarizing in a major way a, 
a big portion of the North Salt Lake City ordinance for our zoning ordinance. <laughs> and so, yeah, you know, so sometimes share, swapping experiences when something dramatic happens or, you know, anyway, just thought. No, it's, that's a great point, Dave. I think, um, you know, sharing experiences and information is what it's all about. You know, we don't need to recreate the wheel every time there's an experience, but rather play off what other people may have experienced uh, to help us come up with solutions. So, um, yeah. We used to do a community highlight, ask one of the communities to, we knew that we're doing some interesting things or had some experiences. Dave, I remember you've done that in the past, but kind of do a 15, 20 minute presentation on, on those war stories and what you're working on. And maybe that's something Spencer, we can think about of, um, or if Dave, you have some other ideas on, or maybe even volunteering to to lead that off. Um, we could do that once a meeting or. Yeah, and that, you know, the APA, we always get the email once or twice a week from some city out there that says, hey, I'm looking at doing something to my ordinance, but is anyone else doing something out there like that? And so one or two, a lot of those are like, nope. And then like, you go to the next email. I don't have any experience in that or no, I'm not interested. But some of the questions out there that thrown around for planners across the state are very intriguing. And one or, you know, a couple of those might have merit to be the, the uh, linchpin for a, a discussion here at these meetings too. So we can pay attention to those as they as they continue to reel out. I think we, we had a few questions and maybe this lands in Hugh's lap. Um, cause I know Salt Lake and Ogden had both put together, um, micro mobility ordinances related to scooters. And I think we shared those via email, at least as examples as, you know, scooters that were getting dropped across the region. So if there are other ideas like that, um, maybe there's a way to bring that forward or utilize this group to help with some of that. Yeah, I mean, is that of interest to the group? I, I guess that's what we're looking for is, you know, these these meetings are are heavy on regional information or experiences that WFRC is having relative to studies or analysis, analysis things they're doing that are helpful to us as communities. But I, we haven't spent a lot of time, to Jory's point, uh, focusing on local experiences and things that are happening here that that we as communities i think in the past have predominantly utilized as as launch pads or opportunities for us to look harder at our codes or policies and inform elected officials about you know what we're seeing happening in in other areas so um really it's about what would this group like to see and what's interesting um as a as a group relative to these meetings rather than just um you know focusing solely on studies and regional things which are important and have a place, but also there's some local opportunity for us as well that we're looking for feedback on. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, um, there are a few things we'd like to bring to you all and want your input on that we do, but I think there's a lot of value in um, us all thinking how do we utilize best this hour and a half that we have together and you know, five times a year and what can we share? Um, so um, maybe Spencer, people could email you or me or somebody as we put the agendas items together. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a great idea. If there's something of interest or you wanna be the presenter on something for, for this meeting and uh, we can allocate some time to that, please send Jory or myself uh, an email so that we can see what needs to be done. Looks like Jay just dropped something in the chat. Uh, air mobility, operational advancement, PDF. Yeah, that's, um, that's that citing report. Okay. Um, I think it'll help all the cities. They, they should definitely take a look at that. No, thank you, Jay. I appreciate you dropping that in there. Um, yeah. Well, we're, we're at our, our time and I don't like to go over because uh, when a meeting's over, it's over. So if you have thoughts, please send those into Joy or myself so we can 
facilitate some opportunities in the coming um, coming year. But just by way of information, item number six, uh, the following dates are for our plan TAC uh, meetings, February 15th, April 19th, July 12th, September 20th, and December 13th. There is potentially one of those meetings we'll do in person um, because Sherry said she would accept that. Um, and so we'll uh, we'll talk about that and, and put out some feelers there. But uh, our next meeting is February 15th of next year. Um, and uh, if you have any thoughts or feelings or emotional outbursts, please send those to Jory. If you have any good information, please send that to me. And uh, yeah, anything else, Jory? That is it. Hopefully everybody has a happy holiday and um, let's keep doing the snow dance and keep that snow coming. That's right. Be happy and safe and enjoy the wonderful white stuff and keep most of it in the mountains. So. All right. Thanks everybody. All right. Thanks all. Thank you. See you. Bye-bye.